and welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo. We have a great show for you today. We have a wow, check out our new gigs. Digs. This is not our regular studio, but it's a wonderful, big, roomy studio. We love it. And we're going to have a show today about uh, a subject near and dear to my heart, which is the Lower East Side, where I've lived for many, many years now and a three-volume set of books called Jews, A People's History of the Lower East Side. And it was edited by Clayton Patterson, who's been a guest on this show. And uh, I'm looking at volume three. In volume one, Joni, who's usually on the show, and hopefully he'll be back soon, Joni Moosey, wrote a story about the synagogues of the Lower East Side for volume one. And we have um, one of the editors, Jim Feast, here on my left, and we have Bonnie Finberg, who's a writer who wrote in several of the uh, uh, editions as well, and who we're going to talk about this book. <coughs> Pardon me. Here it is. Beautiful. We'll be talking more about it later on. It's called Jews, A People's History of the Lower East Side, and it's Clayton Books, with a picture of Clayton Patterson. He published yes, it himself, yes. self-published. All right, and so indexed and the whole deal. Well, tell us, what. where should we start? Uh, maybe I'll start with an overview with Jim Feast, because you were the editor of the series, all three books, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And tell us, what, is the pro what did Clayton want to do? Why did he enlist? First of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, because you've edited more than just this book. You've edited and helped write a number of books. Yeah, I worked as an editor for years. I worked um, with the controversial Gary Null. I uh, co-wrote yeah. a couple of books with him. And congratulations. I was his, editor, I was his uh, producer for three years, four years co-wrote his controversial AIDS, A Second Opinion, and um, Germs, Biological Warfare, long title one, and uh, worked on a lot of other books with him. Then I worked with Nader, Ralph Nader, on mm -hmm. not, re not rewriting, but just editing and fixing things up on a couple of his books. Yeah. Worked with uh, Barney Rossett from Grove Press on his autobiography. He founded Grove Press and never going to view and was a delightful raconteur. And I he died last year, but I worked with him. Mm -hmm. Also in his autobiography, which should be published soon enough, yes. And how did you come into contact with Clayton Patterson? Well, I worked on the... Clayton's got a grand uh, vision of the world, and he, he did a previous vol only one volume thing on uh, social political history of the Lower East Side, Resistance. Mm -hmm. I'm in that on one. That. Okay, great. <laughs> I worked in that on one. that as an editor, yeah. partial editor of that, and that's how sure. we met. And uh, I used to live in the Lower East Side like yourself on Delancey Street, so I was acquainted with him, and so he got me involved in this book. Plus, mm -hmm. I work for the... Published Seven Stories, had done Resistance, so that's how I got involved with him. And I had Gary No books were through Seven Stories, and Ralph Nader was through Seven Stories. And what was the, uh, and, and jump in at any time if you want, this is pretty okay. much a free for all, I'm just starting out now. Uh, what, what was it about any, uh, um, any, spe any stories or any special uh, challenges in doing this, these books? Well, it's a it's a, a compendium of writers of all different types. You know, some were just interviews with uh, with great figures like Tuli Kufferberg and, and uh, Philip Glass, and not that I did them, but I did I did an interview with Judith Molina and with Tuli, and there were others were like pieces written by young writers. Like there's one about a, a kind of a Jewish Lower East Side gangster kind of character who wrote a 80 page piece, and I helped him cut it down and. And there were other pieces that didn't have to be touched, you know. So mm -hmm. it was working with a lot of different authors from all levels of writing ability and also some notable, you know, famous names like Seth de Bachman, as you said, was mm -hmm. in there, and uh, sure. Paul Buell, and, uh, you know, people you don't want to bother their work too much because they right. <laughs> might be right. irritated. But, uh, yeah, so there was all levels and a fantastic book, so much good writing, and there's so much I learned, you know, was uh, some things you copy out of just doing it as a job. This was like, so pleasurable to read and learn. I learned so much about it, you know. Uh huh. So there's yes. a lot to learn about the Lower East Side. Yeah. Bonnie Finberg, you are. Are you a Lower East Sider? Are you? Well, I'm, I guess I was born and raised in Brooklyn, but I moved to the. I guess you could call it the Upper Lower East Side. It was 24th Street. Was my first apartment mm -hmm. between Second and Third in 1966. Wow. What made it your so. interest? What, what? Why was a book like this, Jews of People's History of the Lower East Side, um, an interest to you? Well, I mean, because I'm Jewish, and I kind of came of age on the Lower East Side in the 60s, and then watched it go through all those changes in the 70s, the 80s, you know, the, the gallery mm -hmm. era, and um, my involvement with the writing mm -hmm. uh, group, The Unbearables, mostly in the 90s, and the early 90s on, you know, so I mean, I've just watched it go through all of these transformations, mm -hmm. some not so good. Okay, right. Um, but I mean, part of uh, when I when I was doing the research for this, I, uh, Clayton asked me to do it right before I was 
living in Paris, and I was in, in Manhattan, you know, subletting, and he asked me to do it, and then I had to go back to Paris mm -hmm. and do my research there. So that was a challenge, but it was an interesting challenge. But it also gave me a sense of perspective on how uh, the difference between the Jewish refugees there and, and the kind of communities that had developed there after the war, and the, the, the fact that the Lower East Side, the, the, the golden years of the Lower East Side for, Jew, for Jews was between the wars, mm -hmm. and that they had kind of left behind uh, a lot of the tragedy and were starting new in a way that, and then there was another influx after World War II, but it was a different kind of uh, feeling mm -hmm. than it was in Paris because they were under occupation. They were, met. even even now, it's it's much more under, you know, it's you, you're not out there the way you are here when you're Jewish, okay. you know. So in New York, you, you know, the, the Orthodox Jewish people go around Anywhere they want, anytime they want, sit down anywhere they want, right. talk to anybody they want, wear a dress anywhere they want. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, the Jews. If you like pray in the middle of the street, they pray there, wherever it was. Yeah, I mean, uh, officially. Which is great Jews about are, New York. Yes. <laughs> What's great about the Lower East Side? What's yes. been great about the Lower East Side? Yes, and the, the richness of, of the culture, because I was yeah. focusing mostly on the music. Yeah. And yeah. the music of the Jews on the Lower East Side is really has had an impact on, you know, the world, really. Mm -hmm. Klezmer. Klezmer. That's what you're, you're writing Klezmer, one of your well, there were actually three kinds of, of Jewish music. One was the, the Klezmer music, um, which was more like a folk tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and it, they'd play weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like that. And then there, was the, there were the chazans, who were the, the religious, they mm -hmm. would sing in the temple, in the sure. shul. And then there were the bodkins, who were kind of like, they, they were, they kind of evolved into the Borscht Belt comedians because mm -hmm. they would sing at the weddings, but they would sing very raunchy songs and they'd make lots of raunchy At the Concords. Exactly. Right. Up in the yeah. Catskills, right? Borscht Belt was the Catskills. Right. We would not have Woody Allen without all of that tradition. I mean, that's what I mean in terms of, and the French love Woody Allen, so that's what I mean in terms of the mm -hmm. way the culture has kind of permeated. What is Klezmer? What, what is it? Yes. Well, how do you describe it? Like, is it a certain instrument? Is it a type of music? Is it a lyric? What well, you know, it's interesting. It's it's a kind of music. It's its roots are really in folk music, and it's a kind of combination of the folk and, and religious mm -hmm. music traditions. Um, but it's it's kind of wedding music. It's it's celebratory music. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the other interesting things that I learned from doing the research on this was uh, that the gypsies and the Jews were very close in this, in this mm -hmm. kind of musical tradition, that often if a, a very popular um, klezmorim couldn't appear at somebody's bar mitzvah or wedding because they were out of town, a gypsy would fit mm -hmm. themselves into oh, it and they'd play along. And there, there's a lot of overlap there. Right. That's interesting. Would, uh, are you interested in reading us an uh, excerpt from your... Uh Sure. I, well, my piece is, you know, it focuses on music, but um, it also <laughs> it also focuses on, on a character that I came across um, growing up, who was my Uncle Charlie. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uncle because he was very close to my family. So, I mean, I can read uh, a little excerpt about Uncle Charlie the bootlegger. Because right. he, he grew up on, on the Lower East Side. A bootlegger, so... Uh, he, was, he was a juvenile delinquent that made very, did, did very a, a well for himself. A juvenile delinquent, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A juvenile <laughs> delinquent. He was, and back in the day, uh, in, the, in, the, in the early teens, you know, he was a street, like a street... Uh, what would you call it? A street... Street tough. Street tough, he well, was like, kind uh, of. Like all, all those characters from... I've uh, just been watching that TV show, uh, Boardwalk Empire Boy, mm -hmm. with a bunch of characters. Oh, yeah, they're great. <laughs> they, they run all the characters there. And one of the things I found out about him, because I was looking at the Tenement Museum, and it used to be in, you know, apartments. People mm -hmm. live there, obviously. And they have online, they have the old tenant mm -hmm. list of all the people who live there. And he was one of the tenants of oh, that wow. building. Oh, wow. Isn't that beautiful And I never that? knew that. When you get that confirmation, it's amazing, it isn't it? It was amazing, yeah. Oh, wow. So... And the Lower East Side's like that. I mean, I've heard New York. New York City, Lower East Side is sort of like an onion. Not that it stinks, yeah. but that you ha it has layers. Sometimes. Yeah, stinks. sometimes it stinks too. <laughs> and you peel back each layer is a different era, and before it is another layer. And so right. each apartment, each building, when you go to the Tenement Museum or something, you see who lived there and then before them and before them and before them. Right, like all those layers of paint and wallpaper. Yeah, right, that are peeling off. And right. Okay, well, 
All right, Bonnie Finberg is going to read to us from her excerpt. Okay. Jews of People's History. Um, I was I staying, I was subletting on Orchard Street at the time, which was perfect. Looking down Orchard Street toward Rivington, I can almost see the building where Uncle Charlie grew up. Born in Romania in 1892, he wasn't really my uncle. He had a black Cadillac and handed me a $10 bill every time I saw him. He was the first rich man I ever met. He was a tall guy who dressed well with square white teeth, mostly white hair and bushy black eyebrows. When my mother and aunt met him, he was around 38. My mother, 18 at the time, and my Aunt Betty, 16, were standing on the unemployment line in 1930 when up walks this handsome stranger and asks them if they want jobs. His hair must have been black back then, and he was fresh from the streets of the Lower East Side, an edge of danger, a criminal glint in his eye. Even as a little girl of five or six, I felt his seductiveness. He would always take me aside to give me that much anticipated tenor, an enormous amount of money to a five-year-old in the early 50s. He stood very straight, and his pant legs swung in a way that spoke of good tailoring, even to my innocent hand-me-down eye. He saw these two flapper babes and said, so my mother told me, how would you girls like a job? They jumped at the chance spending the next few months delivering bootleg whiskey in taxi cabs. After Prohibition, Uncle Charlie made his fortune importing J&B Scotch and started a foundation that supported humanitarian causes, including a building for the Henry Street Settlement, which had sent him and a lot of other immigrant boys to summer camp. Should I stop there? If you wish. That's sure. beautiful. All right, great. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie Finberg. All right, so we're talking about <clears throat> a book, Jews of People's History of the Lower East Side, Volume 3. There's two other volumes similar as in size. This these. is in Volume 2. And we have Volume 2. <laughs> Here's, I don't know, they look pretty much the same ones. The colors are different. Co right? Yeah, slightly yeah. different color, Volume 2 and Volume 3. I think, you know, Volume 2 and Volume 3, whatever. And um, so uh, just to go through uh, Volume 3, for example, uh, Clayton Patterson, Editor-in-Chief, uh, Jim Feast, and Monica Erzowitz were the senior editors. Um, and contents, I think you have part one, illicit, business, politics, art, theater, film, photography, and loose ends. Uh, what, uh, tell me, Jim Feast, what was it about this book, uh, what about the, this volume did you uh, find the most interesting? What, what, what stories did you find uh, Well, that's compelling? the volume in which uh, um, I, in which we, we interviewed Judith Molina, and mm -hmm. that's in that I believe that's in that volume, and uh -huh. she's uh, you know we we had a long talk with her about her right. roots in the Jewish community, and it turned out I didn't know this, and maybe people don't know, but she she also has a piece in her, but she uh, when she was about sixteen it was in the Yiddish theater, the gold the last of the golden age of the mm -hmm. Second Avenue. Uh, Those theaters almost all gone. Yeah, I see them one after another ripped down and replaced. There's, there's one left. It's a movie theater. It's on on. Uh, yeah, I think Second Avenue near, but maybe about 12th Street. Uh -huh. yeah, it's that multiplex. theater is the same. F it was the, the, oh, it was the same. Oh, uh, right, it's still there. You're right. And the Sunshine also used to be a theater. Oh, okay. Theater. The but they Sunshine said it doesn't have the same front though. As right. They change it. Yeah. But this theater is the same, and she talked a lot about that and the fact that there were two from Europe, two two uh, theaters that uh, one was more classical and would put mm -hmm. on plays by Goethe and etc. And there's another one was more. Smaltzy and put on a very emotional, mm -hmm. type, melodramatic, melodramatic kind of things, yeah. and that was the kind of she felt that that was a theater that there was something in that theater that was not in you know uh -huh. any theater that that was coming out in that period, and she mm -hmm. wanted to, to recreate kind of a theater of that type in the living theater because she felt there was a community, they had a community in the Jewish. Theater goers belong to kind of a, a community of, that was interconnected, that, where the poor helped, were mm -hmm. helped by the rich, and et cetera. And that com that community had fallen away sure. when, the, when the Lower East Side disappeared. And she wondered, could that be recreated mm -hmm. in a theater where the audience becomes more integral and you know becomes part of the theater? Interesting. You know, that was her. Uh, you know, where uh, where can folks, so without saying any price or anything like that, but where can co people get these books? I where, guess where on Amazon or at the fast disappearing St. Mark's Bookshop, which uh, may not be. Uh, oh, sorry, a it's going to okay. St. Mark's Books Still and up, on it's Amazon, yes. Jews of People's History of the Lower East Side. You can mm -hmm. find it there. Uh, now you you had you brought something to read for us as well, Jim. I was thinking though, if I could read, you know, we as Bonnie mentioned, there's a group unrelated to this called the. Uh, Unbearables Literary Group, which we belong to for 20 years, and a lot of us kind of like we're 
That's mm -hmm. where you got all these writers. You uh -huh. got 35 of us uh -huh. to write for this uh, this book, believe it or not, right? Right. And there's a piece by Sparrow. You know Sparrow? I don't know if you know Sparrow. Well, read it to us. He writes about the Jews and the Unbearables. <laughs> the Unbearables began as a Jewish joke, or anyway, a joke by a Jew, Mike Golden, in 1989. Mike wrote a short story about his friends entitled The Unbearable Beatniks of Light, a cheap pun on the unbearable lightness of being, the famous novel by Milan Kundera. The word beatnik, of course, derives from the Yiddish words like nudnik. <laughs> the Life Cafe on the northeast corner of Tampa Square Park then offered Golden and cohorts a reading, and David Life, the owner of the joint, rechristened them The Unbearable Beatniks of Life and gave each of them a beatnik beanie to wear while they read. Ron Cohn, one of the original crew and half Jewish on his mother's side, Realized the Beatniks already had a rich history, so he and Jim Feast put together an anthology with the catchy title, Crimes of the Beats, so they could drop the Beatnik from their moniker. Out of this joke arose a restless literary and artistic movement, which so far refuses to die. <laughs> the credo of the... Un one more paragraph. The credo of the Unbearables has always been, publish first, edit later. <laughs> Our most characteristic art form is the assembling magazine, where each writer brought 100 copies of her page, later 150 as the magazine grew in stature, to a designated dive bar. Usually the pages were Xerox, but in some cases mimeographed or offset printed. The members of the collective would collate the pages, staple them, and voila, the unbearable assembly magazine. Unlike US News and World Report, however, our mag had 47 distinct poetic voices. Okay, cool. So this so is. So we're a lot of 30 that's of you, us. Are the unbearables, yes, right? but our group has also written a uh -huh. lot of the pieces in this. Uh huh. Person after person, Sorlitsky, uh, who else is in there? Steve Delchinsky. Steve, De oh, Steve Delchinsky wrote five pieces. Um, mm -hmm. what, um, Ron Combe wrote about Hal Sirowitz, one of our most classic members. Is Hawking Bay right in? No, but Eve Packer has a long Tony piece Packer. on Cafe Royal, another great right. Jewish writer. So all the members of the group are writing, but some like Sora and Bonnie even took commissions, you know. I mean, they didn't just write about things they knew. They researched and did, you uh -huh. know. So they put us through a, he put us through cool. a ringer for this book, Clayton. Right, you, know? you really yes. had to come up with something, right? Well, come up, we had to research and had to do hard, hard work. I wrote on uh, um, Morris Rosenfeld's battle with H. Levick, which was a fantastic battle in, like, about 1910 on the Lower East Side, because the, the, the sweatshop poet, Maurice Rosenfeld, who was sentimental socialist, who, who talked about, like, the suffering, and then H. Levick, who came over from... Poland, Escape from Siberia, by where mm -hmm. and uh, was a modernist. He wrote the famous for the Golem, the mm -hmm. play of the Golem. Mm -hmm. But he, if anybody's seen it, it's a kind of a, it's almost an absurdist comedy. You know, mm -hmm. like there's a scene in where the Golem wakes up and he goes, "The world is terrible. I can't live." He says, "Why? Why? Why, Golem? You know, because it's starting to burn. The whole world is burning." Oh no, that's the sun. He was <laughs> 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 so it's like he was playing with tradition, and Mo Rosenfeld right. didn't like this. And Rosen, I read there, his, uh -huh. his great great grandson oh, wrote Rosenfeld wrote a biography. Rosenfeld said Levick drove him into an early grave by attacking him and deriding his like uh, uh -huh. sentimentality. So, right. so, oh, so he wanted it. to be real, just as it was handed down in biblical stories. He didn't yes, like it. Yes, making didn't... fun of it and making light of it and all this kind of but thing. But quoting it, you know, they also made fun of each other. And there's huge attacks. And he called. He said like he goes to a Levick goes to like a, a store, uh, mm -hmm. an old fair in in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, Eastern Europe, and sees this like broken down mechanical man mm -hmm. trying to recite poetry, but that's Morris, mm -hmm. Morris Rosenfeld, it you know, turns out. Mm -hmm. You know, I was reading something in the paper today, um, uh, a study, I, th I think it was one of the, the blogs, um, that a study of young Jewish New Yorkers that seems to, uh, in, in the United States it says, I remember now the article is today's paper, it says a number of people who think of themselves in a religious way of, as Jewish in the United States over the last 50 years has declined half a percent from two and a half to about two percent. Yet, the percentage of people who identify themselves as Jewish culturally or by marriage has increased from seven percent to 22 percent of the United wow. States. Wow. And they said that they, in the two groups, are very different. There's less support for Israel, for example, among younger Jews who do not, uh, and, mm. and greater support from, from the older generation. There's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Yet at the same time, uh, which is interesting, a, a love or an em, uh, embracing of Jewish morality and also a love for intellectual challenge. How does that, how, how do you relate to that in, in some of the things that were written here? I mean, do you, did you see anything like that? Any sort of generational differences or any th changes in mm. how 
Jewish people in New York are identifying or, uh, themselves? You know, maybe I hadn't thought of it before, but I mean, I was just thinking about you, what you were saying and the whole idea. For me, there's this sort of, I was raised in a, a kind of an agnostic family, and I always sought religious experience. Just, I don't know why. I think part of it, and it, it's in the chapter that I wrote, was because I lived across the street from a, from a shul, and I used to hear the, one of the greatest uh, cantors of, in the world, David Kosovitsky, every Saturday. So I, I always had a religious feeling or a spiritual feeling. But while this religious feeling may be slipping away for, certainly for my generation, I, I, I think there's a resurgence of that. And maybe uh, the next generation after me, a lot of them became born again Hasids, uh -huh. you know. But um, for me, the core of being Jewish for me was always this challenge of authority, and that's the way I was brought up. I was brought up by, you know, I was kind of a red diaper baby, and um, so it was always like So Pharaoh set my people free, that idea. Like yeah. The, I have black Americans all, I identified so much with those stories of leaving right. for the promised land right. And, right. and Moses and what have you. Right. So uh, for me, that, that challenging of authority is what kind of has always driven me in terms of my political, I, I, I hesitate to call it activism because you know, I have such high respect for people who are really activists, like the people that go out on the Greenpeace boat. I mean, those are activists. I'm just kind of like, mm -hmm. I show up at, you know, like demonstrations. That to me is easy compared to what they do. But, you know, um, I don't get that same sense mm -hmm. from the younger generation of Jews that I see around me, just the ones close to me, the, my relatives, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Well, how would I... Um for example, uh, in this book, there is uh, you were talking about about the, the the underworld in Lower East Side. You're talking about a bootlegger. Your your uncle yeah, yeah. was a bootlegger, right? right. And, the, and uh, so you know, we know if you read about the history of the Lower East Side or watch some of these popular television programs, you learn about you know uh, uh, Rothstein who tried to fix the. Uh, the World Series in 1919. <laughs> right. You have, uh, you know, all the gangsters, Murder Incorporated, yeah. uh, uh, Meyer Lansky, and all these right. kind of people, and they seem to be intertwined with the mafia and all that. It, uh, it, it, which is interesting because I think a lot of people, when they think, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes that Jews are sort of like nerdy and just are in books all the oh, time, yeah, and, yeah. and yet you have this thing that's total counter to that stereotype. Well, one of the one of the three, uh, the name of the chapter I wrote is uh, Three King, the Three Kings of Klezmer, and. Um, one of them is this guy, Naftuli Brandewine, who was a clarinetist. And uh, I mean, he was like a womanizer and a gambler and a drinker, and he was a real buffoon. And uh, I mean, he was kind of like the Mick Jagger of the klezmer scene. I mean, he had a great <laughs> time when he'd go up to the Catskills. There were women all around. And he was, you know, he was very much pursued by the ladies, as they called them. <laughs> and um, yeah, very much against, against type. You know, what you uh, would think of as type. Right, the stereotype, right. Yeah. And, and uh, I was talking about being against stereotype, Thule Kuferberg, right? Great, <laughs> one of the great, uh, one of the great New York Jewish people, you know, and, and whatever, activist, New Yorker, you know, I, I don't even identify him so. But, you know, you interviewed him, what did you find out? Well, I found that one of the things was both Judith and he, they w defined themselves, they redefined Judaism to fit themselves, or, for, or they, there was much more of a Jewish component in their work than you really, than most people ever knew, or because mm -hmm. they didn't usually necessarily talk about it. just as Judith related to the Yiddish theater, and, and Thule, I think, is more the exact quote, but he said, like, these Jews who have, you know, he said, I guess there's a story, and this is commonly said by them, not just, but that when the Jews got from Egypt to, to the Palestine or Israel, there, there were, like, all these groups where the God of the group was more or less the king, you know, mm -hmm. like Babylon or the sm smaller Babylon. Whereas the, here's a god of like people who are saying, get rid of the king of the pharaoh and come here and, you know, I'm the god uh -huh. of the slaves. And they didn't have gods right. like that. You know, a lot of people yeah. joined, came and tried to join the Jews because they said, here is a group that doesn't have a god, you know, doesn't have a state god that's sort of an authority figure right. that makes you do what, you, what you're supposed to do to be a slave. You know? Which so, is part of why, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah, but that's oh. part of why, you know, many people feel that the fact that the Romans were calling, uh, that they, they labeled Jesus as the king of the Jews was actually a, was a slight against them because mm -hmm. the Jews didn't believe they could have their own, you know, they didn't believe in kings. The king wasn't the pharaoh, he wasn't a god, no. or she wasn't a god, it was so, a... So Tuli said that that's the Jewish have to be anarchists if they're not uh -huh. to be a true Jew, and he had a line, his exact quote was, or more or less exact, is a Jew is a person who is 
a stranger everywhere and a, a stranger everywhere and a, 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 a fan. Can't, that's I'll okay. Quote it. Quote it. Quote it from the book. That's what it's yes. there for. Uh, Go ahead. Well, by the way, we are. Uh, this is Jews of People's History of the Lower East Side, edited by Clayton Patterson. And our, my guest, Bonnie Finberg, who's a writer in the uh, one of these chapters, uh, in one of the, both of these books are in just, just, the, that one. just volume two, volume two. And uh, there's three volumes, as I said. Joni Moosey, who's usually on this show, had a story in volume one. And Jim Feast is a activist, as a editor who worked very hard on this book and made it happen. So go this ahead. This is the one line. He says, I wanted to find the essence of Judaism, this is Thule, that of being at home nowhere and a Jew mm. everywhere. The exile, diaspora, the lack, the not belonging to the ruling class, the not associating with the powers that be, that's my idea of the main theme of Jewish history. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. He, and he just, off the cuff, he would give these very nuggets of great wisdom. You know? right. He was a wise because, guy, the fugs and all that, yeah. Judith did, and as Mani does. Well, that, right. you know, that, what, he's, what he's saying there, it kind of gives you an intellectual freedom mm -hmm. when you're coming from that point of view. It gives you great intellectual freedom. Mm-hmm. What is last two minutes? Um, we talk. About, what about the future of the Lower East Side? Is is Jewish? Is is it something like a Jewish Lower East Side or a people's Lower East Side? Is that is that over? Is it gentrified out? Well, I think you know the idea of a tenement museum kind of says it all. <laughs> that there's a tenement museum, right? <laughs> and there's buildings going up everywhere, yeah. and people are paying thousands of dollars a month rent. Yeah, I mean, anything Jewish there is part of a theme park that, you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> like Little Italy yeah. is similar. Exactly. You know what's not like that is Chinatown, not yet. That's true. Chinatown's still real. It's pretty authentic. Mm. That's true. That's true. But it's unfortunate that it's true that uh, past the, uh, the generation of folks up through the 1960s have, for the most part, dissipated out to the suburbs. Long gone. Yeah, I mean, they're not even in Brooklyn anymore. People in Brooklyn all have, like, Accents from Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> what a <Right>. tragedy! <laughs> <laughs> well, what does um, so th that to me that makes this a very important thing then. To, oh yeah, to it's an definitely. encyclopedia, really. It's three volumes of the right. most amazing. Uh, Something that's, amazing that's not going to be around mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. longer. Yeah. You know that yeah. to, to preserve it, the ideas and the thinking of that generation, so people in the future can know about what happened. Yeah. Right. All right. Last minute. Uh, anything you'd like to add about these books? Uh, where can people get them? And uh, well, as you said, but the, you're, you epitomize it. This this is stuff that great history that's not told anywhere else. The people from the community writing it, rabbis from the community, all kinds of figures that never have written anything before or since, including famous musicians and famous and not famous mm -hmm. musicians. You know. All right. Last words. Well, I, I'm agreeing with what you're saying. People like Lionel Zipperin. I mean. You won't find it anywhere else. And he was a very important person. And the three musicians that I that I wrote about, they were not in uh, any of the books, the encyclopedia books I was looking through. There was nothing with their names. Right. So if you're interested in the history of Jews on the Lower East Side, this is the place to go. It's mm. Jews of People's History of the Lower East Side on Amazon or at East Side Books. See you next week.